recording or just sitting there hoping that it's picking up some sort of spirit information or something and you're thinking about something and your thoughts uh, which do not always express themselves exactly in the same words that your you know that your mind may do it uh could be going right on the tape this falls in line with some really interesting work that's going on right now on reverse speech technology where we're finding out that you can tape record someone talking play it back in reverse and find that there are they are actually speaking their unconscious or their subconscious is actually speaking what they really mean on the tape in reverse and most of the time it's a little bit different because we always form ideas and thoughts before we speak and then when we say something we of course usually tailor it or whatever to kind of fit what's going on or you know to express ourselves in a certain way whereas our subconscious mind is very honest and we don't have to uh, worry about our inside thinking because nobody can hear us. So you may walk up to somebody and comment, gee, you look very nice tonight. And actually what you're really thinking is, oh, I can't wait to get away from this person so I can go get a, you know, a soft drink or something or mingle with somebody else at the party. Uh, but on the tape, uh, when you play it backwards, what's going to really come across is what was really on your subconscious mind. So this technology, if we experiment with a little bit farther, uh, may be the beginning of some new technology which could really change our entire social system as we know it. Imagine if everybody had to tell the truth. There are occasionally some real spirit voices on tape, uh, just as uh, there are some mediums who can actually contact spirits. So she says it is possible that occasionally you do get real spirit voices on tape, but apparently I guess it would be really hard to tell uh, you know, which was really which. They can come from the fine matter world. And here's a clue, another clue into the fine matter world. She says they may come from different fine matter worlds or dimensions. So here they're using the word dimensions, and they're insinuating also that there are different types of fine matter existences, as if there are slightly different levels of it. Apparently you go through different stages in the fine matter world of kind of preparation or something going on before you actually return to the physical existence. Billy also asked about ghost music, if it's possible that spirits can transmit music. And she says, no, that's not possible, that it doesn't happen, that uh, uh, that's not what's going on when people actually record and they get music on tape. It is not from the spirit world. Into that contact, Semyasi, when she said she was leaving, Billy asked her where she was going, if she was returning to the Pleiades, and, uh, or where she would stay sometimes. And she remarked to him at that time that, no, they had a base uh, beneath the mountains in Switzerland. And on many occasions, she would stay there at that, that base. And that they had other facilities all over the planet. I know there was one in Russia, and they did talk it later about building one in the southwestern United States. And there was frequently conversations about something going on in the North Atlantic or underneath the ocean. So they probably have a number of places. Uh, and she mentioned that they are in areas where they would be almost impossible to ever detect, even with our good instruments. So apparently they're quite well hidden. Uh, if they had a base under the North Atlantic Ocean, I would think that would be uh, pretty well hidden. That would be pretty hard to get to. I don't know how we would ever detect that. It was on this contact that she remarked to Billy that she was getting a new ship. She was going to get a new beam ship. The old ones that used the old wave principle of propulsion uh, were you know, very reliable, and they used them frequently, but uh, she was getting a new ship. Actually, this new ship that they had, uh, had coming in, they were getting four of them. And she remarked to Billy that he'd be able to take some pictures. And in the slideshow, if you've seen my slideshow, I had these pictures where Billy's gone out and taken pictures of the four ships all at one time. And they're pretty remarkable pictures. Uh, other people have gotten pictures of the occasional UFO, but very rare to get four of them in broad daylight. So she got a new ship. And by the way, this new ship was, uh, had a little different capabilities than their old one. It had the ability to make a time shift or a time dilation. And she, with that, she was able to move in time and actually visit different time frames. One other group of information that uh, she gave Billy on this contact before she left is she told him that she had noticed that Billy had a group of friends around him that were all interested in this material, and she'd examined uh, their thoughts and listened to the, some of their meetings. And she was uh, not impressed, but she felt that they were all on the right track, and they were a very good group of people for Billy to be with. And he, she suggested that he actually form a group out of these people. And one of the main reasons was it for that she wanted to give Billy some information that he could get out to the world, to scientists around the world about certain things. 
and it would be helpful if he had a group of people to help him do this, to get the information together, do the mailing, etc. So she says, you know, for many years, the Pleiadians had been controlling most of the aspects of the planet. Apparently, they're involved in a number of things like, you know, the, the axis of the planet. They uh, watch the weather. They have uh, some sort of detecting devices all around the planet so they can monitor incoming ships all the time. She says, one of the things that alarmed them is over the past 60 years, they'd noticed a continuous breakdown of our ozone layer. Now, today in 92, we all know that we are having a problem with the ozone. There's arguments over exactly what it is or what's causing it and so forth. But we're aware that something is happening. Uh, in 1975, then Billy's being informed that for 60 years, they'd been monitoring the ozone layer. They were watching the rising use of bromine gases that were floating up into the stratosphere and dissolving the ozone stratum. And she remarked to him at that time that there was 6.38% damage at this time, that even that amount of damage would already start having effect on the life the quality of life of people and animals and nature on the planet. They considered this a dangerous level. This, of course, allows an increase in the ultraviolet radiations of the sun coming through. There would be three different locations, she said, on the planet where, if left unchecked and this continued, that the ozone layer could get so thin it could actually break through and cause a hole in the ozone layer and ultraviolet radiations could come through and be quite harmful. And one of those areas was over America, one of those areas was over Europe, and one of those areas is over South America. So we're starting to see that already. We've seen the one over the South Pole. She did remark that one of the things that scientists aren't aware of is that these ozone holes can wander. They can move. Now, if she said that in 75, we've been aware of the ozone problem now for a few years on our planet by our own scientists, and we haven't seen the ozone hole move. And if they remark that they do control many aspects of our planet, then it's quite possible they're controlling that ozone hole and trying to keep it down at the South Pole where it's not dangerous for us. So the other thing that really surprised them was they quite often monitor a lot of thoughts of scientists and they monitor language all the time. They have these little telemeter devices that look like little small discs and some of them look like round balls. They're all over the planet and they monitor things all the time. They discovered that certain scientists on the planet, uh, being aware of the bromine problem, how it affects ozone, thinking that they could make some sort of weapon that would cause an ozone hole over a certain country, scientists had designed like a bromide bomb where they could set it off actually in the stratosphere, blow a hole in the ozone hole, causing these you know, ultraviolet radiation to rush in from the sun, it would then shine down on our enemies and kill them off. And scientists had actually gone so far as designing and building this bomb, and they thought this was just crazy. So this is why they were uh, remarking Billy to get his group together and try to alert some people about this, because if you blow holes in that ozone, she said it can, uh, naturally it would take hundreds of years before that to heal and get rid of those holes. So she suggested that Billy contact a uh, Professor McElroy at Harvard University and let him know uh, what was happening and give him this information, which he did. Billy did send the information to Harvard, but he never heard anything back. So uh, I would imagine if uh, Professor McElroy ever hears this tape or knows about it, uh, he may remember that letter. But he may have uh, thought a little unusual to get a letter from a farmer in Switzerland about problems in the ozone when it was barely detectable at that time. At that time, several people were uh, coming to see Billy quite frequently, and this was the beginning of the idea of forming the group around Billy, which later became called the FIGU, which is a German acronym for Free Community of Interest in the Border and Spiritual Sciences and UFOlogy. And today we know there's a thriving group of 49 people in it. So um, that was the beginning of it. Okay, that's the end of this side of the tape, and I'll just fade out here, and I'll see you on tape two.